Nathaniel, great to be hosting this with you. How's yeah, it going? It's good. It's awesome to be hanging out on uh, on having day on another day where there's absolutely no resolution with the coronavirus or anything that we're supposed to do with it. So it should be a should be a good conversation, I think. Um, and to kick that conversation off, we have a really great set of people, a variety of topics, but we're kicking it off with Neil Ferguson. Neil is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He's a Senior Faculty Fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. Many of you know him from books like The Ascent of Money or his most recent, The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power from the Freemasons to Facebook. And recently he produced a documentary series on PBS called Neil Ferguson's Networld that included a focus on pandemics. Neil, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. So let's dive right into the history of pandemics. You've had a, a bunch of context to spend time on this issue. What are some of the most important lessons or the most salient lessons from the history of pandemics that we can learn or that we can apply today? Well, I suppose the first one is that it's extremely difficult to say at the outset of a pandemic uh, just how big it's going to be. Uh, there were a couple of pandemics in history, uh, one during the time of the Roman Empire, one in the mid-14th century, uh, the second one being the Black Death, that had an absolutely devastating impact on humanity and killed, we estimate, about a third of human beings living at that time. Uh, so when you first hear there's a new contagious pathogen that's killing people, uh, the correct response is maximum paranoia. Now, it, it was feared that this particular pandemic, though it wasn't going to be as bad as the Black Death, might be as bad as the 1918-19 influenza pandemic, which was one of the world's worst uh, but not as bad as those two I mentioned before, because it killed a mere 3% of humanity, nothing by comparison to the Black Death, but rather a lot of bodies if you start doing the math. So that explains why uh, people uh, back in uh, February, March, shifted from, I thought, uh, complacency to panic, because it suddenly seemed possible that as many as 2.2 million Americans could die. That was the estimate that another Neil Ferguson, not to be confused with me, the epidemiologist at uh, London's Imperial College, came up with, with his model. And it, it led to a drastic change of policy. Now, of course, I don't myself think that it's that uh, dangerous uh, a virus. I'll be very surprised if it's as devastating as the 1918-19 influenza. And so let me just conclude by offering the consoling reflection that most pandemics in history are not as bad as the ones I've mentioned. And in fact, it's easy to think of one in the relatively recent past uh, that's almost forgotten now. That, that was the influenza pandemic of 1957-58. I suspect this pandemic's probably in the same league as that one in terms of its lethality. Uh, but nobody now remembers that one because uh, it really wasn't as disruptive uh, socially or economically as the ones I was talking about before. So... Today is obviously the Bitcoin halving, and a lot of people are thinking about Bitcoin. Uh, and one of the core Bitcoin value propositions has been um, as a hedge against inflationary policy uh, by Federal Reserves. And yet, um, we're seeing uh, a very strong dollar, despite more dollars being pumped into the economy. Um, from a historical perspective, what do you think is more worrisome the strength of the dollar and its implications like local currency failure or the potential for the dollar to inflate on the back of rampant money printing? Well, it's a great question to ask at this moment in time. Uh, one of the big differences between a natural disaster like a pandemic and a man-made disaster like a war is that wars historically have been very clearly inflationary. Pandemics, not so much. Uh, indeed, it's obvious that in the short run, the effect of this particular pandemic has been quite strongly deflationary, mainly because governments took the decision to shut down large parts of the economy. And that shock has uh, created the biggest recession, I think, probably since the early 1930s, because it's already looking a lot worse than 2008, 2009. So nobody really should be wringing their hands and worrying about inflation in 2020. I think that's uh, that's a fear for the future 
I think there's a couple of points worth making. First, it's a bit odd from a historian's point of view that so much discussion of Bitcoin and indeed other cryptocurrencies has been based around a hedge against inflation because actually during the period of Bitcoin's existence, the real problem from the vantage point of most central bankers and economists has been the lack of inflation, the very low inflation that we've, we've seen. Uh, the second point that I think is uh, worth making is that uh, at some point there certainly will be inflation, but where is the question? It's going to be in places that uh, have a, a track record of uh, currency depreciation and default, not in the United States, not in Europe, but try Latin America. Uh, and you already see in parts of Latin America, even before the onset of the pandemic, the problem uh, the breakdown of the government uh, in Venezuela, for example, has created a hyperinflationary situation there. So I think it's not clear that there's a single one rule fits all for the whole world. Some parts of the world are going to have inflation, already have it. Others, for the time being, are going to be grappling with deflation. And what we just don't know, because I don't think anybody knows the answer to this, is whether all the measures that have been taken by the Federal Reserve and by US Congress will ultimately be inflationary. Massive deficit, and then a great deal of money creation in the name of quantitative easing, big expansion of the central bank balance sheet. You might think, well, gee, that really has to be inflationary. But you might have thought that back in 2009, 2010, 2011, and you'd have been wrong. So I'm, I'm very reluctant to predict some great inflation at this stage, when in the short run, at least, it's deflation we need to worry about. I think the point that there are lots of different contexts that we're seeing play out as it relates to the relative strength of currencies is a really salient one. Um, in a conversation a few weeks ago with uh, Coindesk Michael Casey, you actually talked about the currency regime writ large more broadly and said that we're in an age of experimentation. And this was even before coronavirus, right? Where we had last year the introduction of Libra. We had the then Bank of England Governor Mark Carney talking about a synthetic hegemonic currency. Which, if any of these experiments, we'll call them, in the age of experimentation for currencies, do you see as being uh, accelerated either positively or negatively by the, the COVID-19 crisis? Well, actually, one that you didn't mention, which is all the experimentation with digital currency and electronic payments uh, going on in China. Interestingly, the Chinese uh, were already accelerating their experiment with central bank uh, digital currency almost the day after Libra was announced. Uh, because it clearly sent a signal to Beijing that the U.S. might be waking up. Uh, so there's been an acceleration uh, in both the use of uh, electronic payment platforms like uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay and the central bank digital currency as a result of the pandemic. And the Chinese authorities are trying to use various forms of digital money to get cash into consumers pockets the big problem they have in china is the problem that we're going to see pretty much everywhere you can restart employment you can restart manufacturing but you can't restart consumer demand so i think that's really where the most action is is happening uh, and i i think it's a it's an illustration of a point that i remember making when i uh, spoke with michael at davos and, and wrote about last year that in some ways the United States is lagging behind, broadly speaking, in, in fintech. It's lagging behind in electronic payments. It's lagging behind when it comes to digital currency. There's a small C conservatism that pervades, pervades US institutions, uh, which is why, of course, Libra was kind of not quite strangled at birth, but certainly uh, prevented from jumping you know, out of the crib. And, and what's emerged is a much reduced uh, form of Libra, I think reflecting the fact that regulators in Washington just said no to the first iteration. On a similar theme, uh, when it comes to uh, decay, uh, your last two books discussed first something you called the great degeneration about institutional decay, and second, the power and influence of networks. How have those themes uh, come together to help you make sense of the COVID-19 crisis and the response? Well, very strikingly, because the the series that was based on the Square and the Tower uh, Networld, which went out on PBS in March, essentially argued that a highly networked world was vulnerable 
despite all the benefits of global integration, uh, networks as big and fast as the ones we've built, both in the digital world and in the physical world, can transmit bad stuff with breathtaking speed. Now, we were all very focused in recent years on viral memes, especially ones that originated in Russia. But it turns out that proper viruses, the biological sort, can also move with astonishing speed. You know, one of the, the things that's fascinating when you study the history of pandemics is that uh, it's the speed of, of travel that really often determines the speed with which a pathogen can get around the world. And of course, there's never been more travel integration, higher speed travel integration than there was at the beginning of 2020. So yeah, NetWorld and the book, The Square and the Tar, helped, I think, show that a networked world was very vulnerable to a variety of different viral crises, uh, the digital variety and the biological variety. The great degeneration is relevant because you have to ask the question, why was it that the federal government, which on paper was very well prepared for a pandemic, had a huge complex 36-page biodefense strategy published just a couple of years ago, why it was that the federal government failed so miserably to respond to this. And I think mainstream media has done a poor job of covering this because they're so obsessed with the personality of, of Donald Trump. And they really haven't asked the question, what exactly were the bureaucrats in the Department of Health and Human Services doing in January when the news was coming in uh, that there was a new virus loose uh, in China? Because they appear to have been asleep at the wheel and asleep right the way through February and into March. So I think we see here a very good illustration of a point that I was trying to make in The Great Degeneration. We have quite a big complex government with lots and lots of different acronyms and lots and lots of different departments, sub-departments, undersecretaries, all with plans for biodefense. But, you know, bigger isn't necessarily better. And this big government coped really much worse with the, uh, the pandemic of 2020 than its much smaller predecessor did with the pandemic of 1957. Yeah, I think that's really, one of, for me, one of the most surprising features of this. And it's not true just of the US, it's true of the UK too. Whereas their governments, uh, Taiwan, for example, right next door to the People's Republic of China, which coped brilliantly with the pandemic by acting very early and then, and this is interesting, using technology to make sure that once they got testing done, they could do contact tracing very efficiently. And Taiwan, for the community that's tuning into a program like this, is the real role model. We should have been copying the Taiwanese approach, particularly the way in which the Taiwanese use a contact tracing app in a way that doesn't compromise personal privacy. We, we ended up learning lessons from the wrong China. We thought we should be copying the People's Republic of China and imitating what they did in Hubei with a total economic lockdown. No, we should have been learning from the other China, the Republic of China, and learning from the way in which Taiwan used technology, acted early, and was able to contain the pandemic despite being right next door to its point of origin. It, it brings up a, I mean, the institutional decay, the institutional failure is a is a rabbit hole that you could spend the rest of this evening and the rest of the station uh, rolling down. But there's one other kind of, I don't know if it's an institutional failure, but it's certainly something that's causing a lot of eyebrows to raise. In the Boston Globe a couple of weeks ago, you wrote that we are simultaneously suffering a public health disaster, inflicting a deep and long recession upon ourselves, and breaking the record for an equity market rally. How can we, how how do you resolve this type of paradox? How do you try to make sense of these seemingly uh, paradoxical factors? Well, I think the simplest explanation, the one I offered in that column, is that if monetary and fiscal policy have as their primary goal to shore up the price of financial assets, including even junk bonds, which the Fed said it was willing to buy, then, of course, financial markets are going to send a distorting signal. I mean, if you just look at the financial data, if you only knew the S&P 500, you would say, oh, no, Biggie, you know, this, this market's back to where it was in October. Uh, but then you look at the real economy and you think, holy Moses, this is actually worse, potentially worse than the Great Depression. You know, we actually are heading for an unemployment rate when it's next denounced that's likely to be as high, maybe even higher than in the depths of the depression of the early 1930s. So how can the stock market be accurately reflecting 
uh, not just the state of the economy, but what it's supposed to do, which is the path of, of future revenues. I mean, there's another answer, though, and that is that the S&P 500 overrepresents uh, big technology companies that are probably going to be, on balance, beneficiaries of the pandemic, Amazon being one, Microsoft being another, Apple uh, and Google, and to a lesser extent, Facebook. I mean, all these big tech companies, as I think is now generally recognized, have had time accelerated. They they are now getting to where they thought they would be in five or 10 years, uh, in five or 10 weeks. The world has become suddenly much more virtual. We're doing this uh, through the internet in a way that we probably wouldn't have done before. In fact, we certainly wouldn't have done before. So I think one thing that the stock market is reflecting is that for big tech companies, this is on balance a benefit. They're likely to, in fact, earn more money over the foreseeable future than they otherwise would have. So I think that's that's a good reason, a rational reason why stock, stocks are doing so much better than the real economy. But when you look at a broader index, uh, look at the an index uh, that actually reflects U US businesses of the more medium-sized variety, then it's a, a lot nastier. And I think that's a more accurate reflection of where most businesses are in this really shocking recession. Yeah, it's it's a it's a crazy time. And so maybe one more just to to wrap this up. And obviously, as a historian, you spend a lot of your time looking backward. But I, I want to ask you to look forward a little bit. You've said the idea of an after COVID isn't really as accurate as thinking about living with COVID. That maybe we should change our perspective. What do you think are the most important decision points that may be coming up, right, for governments or other institutions as we try to figure out what it means to live with COVID? Well, it was Churchill who, who said, the further back you look, the further forward you can see. And I've always studied history, not really for its own sake, but in order to think about plausible futures. I think if you imagine that uh, getting a vaccine is going to be harder than is generally assumed, uh, imagine it, it's as difficult as uh, getting a vaccine uh, for, say, HIV. Uh, then you have to imagine a scenario in which we're living with COVID-19 and after COVID-19 is, is kind of an illusion. Uh, in that circumstance, I think, I think every business has to have a game plan that's at least a two-year duration game plan because in the best case, there's not going to be a vaccine generally available until late next year, I suspect. Uh, and in a worst case, if, if a vaccine isn't successfully developed, or if we end up with a very imperfect vaccine, like the vaccines that we have for influenza, then we are going to be living with COVID-19 for even longer than two years. And that means that a whole range of activities are going to be altered. Uh, we, we won't just be wearing face masks occasionally, we'll be wearing them routinely. Restaurants like the ones that reopened in Switzerland today will actually have to halve their capacity because of the different spacing of tables that's going to be necessary. We'll all be traveling less by air because traveling by air is going to be really quite unpleasant as well as a little bit scary. I argued in a piece I just published uh, in today's Boston Globe that we can learn from the experience uh, of HIV AIDS. Over time, behavior did change because in a way, AIDS was to sex what COVID-19 is to social life. And we will alter our social behaviors in the way that the people did alter their sexual behaviors once it became clear how deadly the HIV virus was. Uh, th th that seems like a good analogy to me. Uh, not that we've completely changed our behavior, because in fact, people still engage in unsafe sex. And I think people will engage in unsafe social life uh, for the future. It, it, it's just that we're very imperfect uh, as human beings, even when we're told, hey, there's a deadly pathogen out there, uh, we, we find all kinds of reasons not to behave entirely in a risk-averse way. So I think the world will change, but it probably won't change completely because we just won't be able to kick some of those silly social habits that actually do make you vulnerable to COVID-19. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. That was uh, super interesting and informative. My pleasure.